Hello and welcome to the Manchester Blue Show. Uh, I'm Dan Halifax, even though if you're watching on YouTube it says Tom Brunn, but I've got a bit more air than him. Uh, and tonight we have a very special guest, which is the one and only Nader Manua. Welcome hey. to the show, pal. Hey, thanks for having me, Paul. How are you doing? I'm stoned. So to start off, Nader, I've noticed, I've got the shirt on which I thought, personally, you played your best City football in. We'll get into okay. that later. But uh -huh. under Sven, I've got a lot of happy memories of you in this shirt, especially your goal against Bolton when you're yeah. kissing a uh, kissing fan celebrating. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so I will tell you this now. Uh, we've had Chappie on the show. Yeah, um, legend. Absolute legend. And he's coming on for part two soon because he couldn't get enough stories in. Anyway, I thought, I'd text him today because I thought, if anybody might have a bit of date on you or a story, <laughs> yeah. that we could go, I text him and I said, uh, have you got anything I could stitch him up with? And he texts me back saying, not really. He's a sound, intelligent gentleman, lovely man. I would never be controversial or cause any trouble. Please give him my best. Oh, well, I, I text my dad and I said, Dad, have you got anything nice to say about me? He says, your brain's never been used. <laughs> Not from my dad. <laughs> yeah, I see that. I see that. No, Chappie, Chappie's so, a legend. Like, he looked after myself, all the young players and so on, and of that part of City, that time at City, like he was the main guy that set the culture. So, you know, to have yeah. to be praised by him, like Chappie's a legend. You know, I appreciate everything he did uh, in that time because wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. No, absolute gentleman. And like I say, uh, so it probably goes underrated, uh, the role he played. If You know, from the outside looking in, obviously City fans know a Chappie, but really, like you're saying then, some of the players he helped bring through, like yourself, Richards, uh, I know Michael Johnson didn't reach the heights, but still. So anyway, yeah. so we'll start. We'll start from the beginning, uh, Nader. How did City come about for you? Um, so I was playing for AFC Clayton. Um, I was playing my age group and the age group up. So I was playing Saturday, Sunday. I think this is when I was like nine, ten years old. And then for one of the teams, we were a disaster. We won two games all year. But then for the other team, like we were quite good. I actually got scouted in the cup final for the team, which was actually quite good. And I yeah. uh, joined the Centre of Excellence at the time at the age of 10. And an interesting bit of that story is, uh, so I, we played in the cup final, we won. Afterwards, my dad told me I've got trials for City. I was like, oh, this is amazing, so on. Went to the trials, did all that stuff, got straight back into the team. But it was a little while later, he told me that I also got scouted for United. And the um, and he said to them, there's no point asking because he's a City fan, so he's probably not going to want to join. <laughs> but I'll hold my hands up. At that time, at the age of 10, I wasn't that big a City fan, so I probably would have had a go. <laughs> but but obviously, you know, it ended up being the right decision. So yeah, I joined the academy at 10, went through all the different age groups, went through the whole process of sort of like being a ball boy, getting a chance to go to main road, all that stuff. And I was loving it. You know, it was, it was special. But like the ball boy had happened when we were in Division 2 and things like that. So it wasn't exactly prime time city. But then, you know, you go through those stages, get back to the Premier League. Um, you know, my, my academy team was pretty good. By the time we were under 15, between like under 15 and maybe 17, we probably lost maybe three or four games in that whole time. So we were, we were a decent side. And considering what the academy was like at the start when we were getting beaten by everyone, you could see like the ball was in motion. Mm. And that was like the time when you're seeing people like Sean and I Phillips coming through and the conveyor belt was happening, you know, where there was so much like yeah. young talent coming through our city. Um, so, yeah, that, that was all going on then. And then I was lucky enough to make my debut at 17 and I was one of probably, I think it might have been, number like in the 30s or whatever in terms of academy graduates who ended up playing for the first team and who knows what was to come mm. ahead but as I say I came through and I came through under Kevin Keegan even though I played most of my games under Stuart yeah. Pierce came through under Kevin Keegan and yeah. looking back now to have had Kevin Keegan as a manager of Man City at the time where the club really wasn't that brilliant you know what I mean he's somebody yeah. who you probably would have expected in later years but I learned a lot from him learned a lot from the the teams I was in and all that stuff. And I yeah, ended up having a 16-year career with that foundation of being at City at that time. Yeah, I mean, like you say, you came through under Keegan. Um, bit of a great manager at City, I think, Keegan, because uh, he sort of got us the ball rolling again, didn't he? And mm. 
Um, he sort of goes under the radar with it, but like, like you said, uh, some top players coming through at the same time as you. Now, just while we're on the youth, what 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 do you think to, to our city are now with the youth? Do you think if you were going there now, do you think people, many players think, "Oh, I'm going to break into this team," or are we literally just a stepping stone? Um, I think for City now, the talent that they have there, I think. Ultimately, there are, not every player in an in academy squad has ambitions of playing for a first team, but they would take a sense of pride in playing for Man City's academy and having that education. So we shouldn't necessarily like rate everybody the same way. But there are players who are there who are exceptionally talented for their age. And there is potential for them yeah. to maybe get a chance in the first team. Like obviously Phil Foden is like, he's out of this world. So he, you know, you could say he's one of whatever. But as far as academies go, yeah. like, as was the case back when, and even to this point now, I believe that an academy, if you have the right sort of parents and the right people around you, you can use it to the best of your potential. And if, if everything goes right, you play for your team and play for years. If things go wrong, you might end up leaving your team, but then having a career, you know. So as far yeah. as City go, the players that they have, I think they're producing lots of players who will end up having really good careers. Not necessarily all at City, but to, for yeah. example, think about like, in the last 10 years, you could have been a great striker for City's academy, but you've been playing behind Sergio Aguero. Like, that circumstance. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you're a bad player. It just means you're not as good as Sergio no. Aguero at that particular point in time. So for me, as I say, the academy itself, it's, it's changed a little bit in terms of the investment into it and so on. But, you know, if I, I would still send my kid there because I think it's a great opportunity. And if it doesn't go wrong, it's a great spot to leave from because the step down from City isn't necessarily a step to nowhere you could go anywhere from City with a great yeah. education and having had great facilities and a great understanding of under, yeah. like playing with some of the best players in your age group See I'm glad you said this because I've uh, you'd be surprised how many City fans actual fans are disappointed at that there's not three or four academy players coming through every year and I've sort of hit on what you're saying like they're, they're, they are brilliant for their age but they might not make it here, but they are still good players. But like you're saying, how can you dislodge, like, Gundogan? Uh, if you're mm. a good centre midfielder, Gundogan's a World Cup winner. How yeah. can Pep go into him and say, oh, do you know what? We're going to give this 17-year-old a run out in your place. It, mm. it's, it's hard. It's yeah. hard keeping the senior players happy and, and helping the youth. But... Do you know, to, to add to that point, which, is, um, which I felt myself is quite significant, so City, we were whatever we were. And then the money came in and the expectation came in. And say, if you talk about City today, the expectation is that they will win every game. They've been favourite for pretty much 99% of games they've played this entire season. Mm. So when it's like that, and there's not even a sense of joy most of the time when you win because it's just so expected, you don't view things yeah. in the same way. Because like I say, from my age group, there were lots of us who came through and we were good players. But I remember when the money came in, even from a fan's perspective, the expectation changed and you needed players who weren't potentially going to be good. You needed players mm. who were good because you had to win this game. You had to try and win this league. And whereas in the yeah. past, it was time to nurture them and make them better. It's for City now and all those other teams at the top. There's no time for people to get better. They have to hit the ground running. No. They have to be great. You know, and that's ultimately like a downside for academy people. But it's a price of success, I guess. And, well, let's look at Sean Wright Phillips uh, at that time. He's come through. An offer's come in for him. The club can't refuse it. Mm. It'd have been brilliant for Sean Wright Phillips to stay in City. And I, I believe he said he said he wanted to stay. But yeah, he did, yeah. If you're a decent academy player and then one of the big boys comes for you, the, usually the clubs have got to sell to fund, fund other things, which is a sad sad thing. But, yeah, so, sure. anyway... Um, Right, this is only because something that's come up recently and it's not to do with your career. I don't want to know money or anything like that. But do you know when you're signing your pro contract, such as mm. we, we, we were discussing, obviously, the European Super League the other day. But what, what would happen with that and your contracts? Would you, are your contracts stating what league you're playing? Or, because I know yes. you have bonuses for getting in Europe and relegation, so... Well, you say, you say that about bonuses for getting into Europe, but City are a team now whereby qualifying for Europe, if they finish fourth, it's not a successful season. 
So you wouldn't necessarily reward yeah. people for that. And as well, in terms of salaries, they're higher now than they were back when. We need to incentivize yeah. them to give them the chance to do it. Like I think uh, yeah. it's probably within the last five, six years, they got rid of win bonuses because as I say, the expectation is there and people are making enough money anyway. All right. Do you know what I mean? To not necessarily be thinking, you know, this is a huge, huge deal to win this game and to give us that little bit extra and so on. And that's just, you know, as I say, wages are a lot, lot higher. And as far as the Super League goes, I think people will have to have something put into their contract, whatever, in terms of winning it or, or whatever you But I don't know. It, it would have been a very, very interesting contractual thing to deal with that. Because, you know, as I said, nobody yeah. has that in their deal already. So if they had to put something in, how do you word it? And then it would probably mean that that deal itself would be the same for all the clubs, all the players in all the clubs who would be in it. And it's very rare yeah. that everybody has a sort of blanket bonus scheme yeah. or system, whatever. But thankfully, it doesn't seem like something we'll have to worry about. Oh, no, it was just, I would just, we were just saying like, Obviously, it seems like the clubs just dropped it on them, and we were saying, "Well, surely the players are contracted; they could, they could just leave the club." I don't know, but anyway, like you say, it, it's done and dusted yeah, now, so to, and, and I hope it point. stays like that. No, do you know about that point? You say players could just get up and go and whatever. Like lots of players were very unhappy about it, and I think the fans' side of it really did help. But I think the players' bit sealed the deal as well, because if they're mm. saying they don't want to do it then you can't really host a game because, you know, unfortunately we've been in a yeah. place where we've gotten used to seeing games without fans, but you've not gotten used to seeing games where players aren't trying, you know, and if that is what would have happened in the Super League where you essentially roll the ball and then people just stood and just watched in terms in protest, then it creates a different sort of situation. But then, like, as I say, if the players said, well, we all have to leave, the, some of the players that City have right now are some of the best in the world and you could say they'd have to leave, but if other clubs are involved in the Super League, where they're leaving to? Can you imagine a Kevin De Bruyne playing for Leicester or whatever? You know what I mean? It doesn't. Yes. It doesn't. It doesn't add up. So thankfully, as I say, that situation is not, isn't going to be a thing. Yeah. Um, I, well, we'll carry on with this now because I've got another point. But I'm that as well. I uh, a lot of people say no. It's all the fans' voice. I don't think. I mean, I'm a fan, and I was protesting myself. And I don't think it was the fans' voice. I think you're right. I think it was players. Moan saying they're not going to do it, and I also think the money might have not have been as where they were, and I, and I think that's the sorry state of affairs that football's got into now. And hopefully, hopefully, fans will get a bit more power in the future. But yeah, it's so here's my here's my take on this because I'm not going to say it wasn't down to the fans because I think the the voices of the fans was like incredible, and it's not just fans mm. of their teams; it's fans of the game of football. Because you saw people yeah. who were in the media or wherever, even flipping Boris was getting involved and all that stuff. So all that stuff, like it really did matter. But like I say, I think the little, the final bit, the cherry on the top, was the player standpoint. And because as well, like mm -hmm. some of the issues which people have with the Super League about how it's greedy and so on and so forth. Like football has been a greedy industry for a very long time. It's been about money for a very long time. And to to sort of counter a point where say someone might believe that it's totally for the fans because, you know, fans do really, really matter. You ask yourself the question, like, why is football being played with no fans at the stadium to this point? Why has there been a year of no fans? And it's because of the money. Because it, there's, there should have been enough money. You send people in an ideal world, if it's only, only about fans, like maybe the season would have stopped last year and someone said, we're not going to play again until we've got fans in the stadium. But instead yeah. they played it to get the money for the TV rights and all that type of stuff so they can have another year go by. And like, yeah. you know, the game is not the same without fans. But then, as I say, the game's also driven by yeah. money all top to bottom because otherwise, as I say, no club would be playing. Yeah. I, I'm a match going fan, Nadine, um, right? And I don't wear that as a badge on but I am. And uh, I said at the start of the season, I, I said, I hope City win it, but to me it's tainted. He's tainted to me. The League Cup, I wasn't lucky enough to go to the League Cup. I didn't get a ticket. That's the first final I've missed since I've been a City fan, you know, since we've been winning things. And no matter what happens now, there's always going to be, well, I actually never made, went to that final. If mm. we get to the Champions League final, I'm probably not going to be able to get there. Do you know what I mean? Even, even if we, fans were allowed in the stadium, I couldn't get a ticket. I'd have flown to Istanbul and just been there with the fans and that. Yeah. That's, 
So even, no matter what we win, to me personally as a fan, he's been tainted. And I'm glad you're saying it as a footballer, you set like an ex footballer, yeah. because I think I think that shows the people that you do care. And I think a lot of a lot of fans will appreciate you saying it. No, no, honestly, like it's everyone knows it's not the same. Like I was lucky enough to have been working for that Carabao Cup final. And the things which you forget, yeah. for example, I'm just I was just going on TV or whatever, and then the players come out for the warm up. The announcer makes the same announcement I've heard a thousand times over in this last year, but now there's a reaction between the yeah. players and their fans. F- fans happy to yeah. see the players coming out, players buzzing to see the fans coming out. Like that feeling there, yeah. you forget you've not felt that for a whole year. And ultimately, like when you're in a mm. stadium and you have people to celebrate with and to go through the emotions with, yeah. you know, it's a game of football, which we love. And that's why, as I say, as a player, it makes a huge difference to, to have them there. Mm. Yeah. Nadim, I mean, this has been, <laughs> I really enjoyed that, but we're going to have to get back to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> this is about you, this chap. So, um, you said you played your most football under Stuart Pearce. I thought you made your most well, appearance under Mark Hughes. No, what, what I meant was, I was comparing, I was saying between Kevin Keegan and Stuart Pearce because I made my debut under Kevin Keegan, but then I didn't play much after that. Oh, right. But I finished that next se- that finished that season playing the last 10 games of it when we finished ninth or whatever. But Mark Hughes was the person who probably played yeah. for the most. And to look back in that time, like, when I was younger, I was I think I was quite injury prone. Never like huge injuries, but enough to sort of derail momentum. But I was always trusted by the managers. And sometimes I might not start a season, yeah. but I always seem to finish it. And um, unless you want to ask a specific question about a certain time, like no, I can tell no, you about the time actually, if you want. No, uh, well, actually, I wanted to ask you about injuries, right? Because like you say then, niggling injuries your whole career, you must be a very mentally strong guy to come back from that. And no, play as long as you did. No, the, the thing with the injury situation was uh, I had a lot more when I was younger, but it meant that I played most of my games at the other end because then when I was at QPR, I think in 2014, I played yeah. every minute of every league game. So that's 46 games in the championship, two full cup games. And I played and yeah. I took part in every training session for the whole year. And from that point, yeah. I probably missed from when I was like 28 I think something like 29, I've probably missed maximum in total, maybe 20 games, something like that, possibly 30. Really? That's, that's across five, six years. So it was it was a case of when I was younger, learning what it was to be like a really good professional because some people are just extremely robust, but I wasn't that at the time. But you learn more about your body. And under, it was under Mark Hughes, actually, where you sort of introduce players to really focusing on hydration, on diet and prehab, on pre like doing pre-activation before training sessions, all the importance of the gym stuff, why you do things. And you learnt more then because for him, it wasn't just about just going out on the field. He was bigger picture trying to create athletes and so on. So from that point for me, yeah. I was far healthier and I was available for far more games. And it meant that, you know, when I went on runs and sides and so on, you know, I ultimately played better instead of, you know, being in and out and constantly having to chase fitness and all that stuff. See, I can sort of liken what you went through uh, to John Stones mm. he's had niggling his injuries and he's not really his city career has been stop start stop start and then like you say this year he's he's managed to put it behind him and look look, look how well he's playing so yeah, he, he, sure. like you say similar you age and he's just getting it, to that it, it just it just depends some people some people start strong and they finish weak some people start weak and finish strong you know throughout their careers but once you get it yeah. You get it. And if you can really get it sooner, then things can be great. Because I remember Gareth Barry when he first signed for City. I think it might have been year two. He, he hurt his hamstring. And he was like 30 at this point, maybe 31. And he was a bit worried about it. And I was thinking, why is he so worried or whatever? He said, oh, it's my first time. Like, hurt my hamstring. I was like, okay. And I said, how long you, I said, this is, I said, how long you out for? He said he was out for a week. And he said that's the longest he's been injured for in his career. He said that at 31 years of age. And you think to yourself, my goodness. That's like, that's special. That is special. But not everybody has that luxury because you look at someone like Vincent Company who had injuries when he was younger, but then wasn't injury prone until he was older, you know, and that must have been very hard. And the mental side of it is tough, especially when you're not, if you're not playing in a side that's doing well, you can't help but question your role in things, whether you're on the bench, whether you're injured and so on, because you, you are part of the squad, but you're still an individual within it. 
And your future doesn't, yeah. you're, you're not going to have a long term future at a club if you're always the guy coming off the bench or if you're always the guy that's on the treatment yeah. table. So you can enjoy the moments, but you can't enjoy it in its totality because you've not really earned it yourself, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I've, I mean, I listen to a lot of footballers talking podcasts and I've had a few, fair few on here myself. Like, And like you, they always say about injuries, when you're injured, you're in the squad, but you're doing your own training, you're getting your own fitness back. So even though you're around the lad, I mean, that must be hard. So in yeah. itself, like you say, just the, men, yeah. just the mentality that, of not having crack every day. To, to talk about that one as well, just for a little bit longer, like when I spoke to one of my old QPR teammates, Ali Farley, like he had a bad knee injury. And I didn't realise until he came out and said it recently that one of the hardest things for him to deal with was, was when people would ask him, oh, when are you back? How long are you back? And it feels like mm. it's an innocent question. But that was the toughest thing for him to answer because he had to say it so many times and he honestly never knew. You know, maybe mm. he's never going to come back to full fitness again. It's, well, maybe it's not next week. You know, he's just he's like he might have just done a rehab session where he couldn't run properly. And someone comes in and says, oh, you must be back soon now. But when you live it day to day and through every minute of the day, it's different to when somebody sees you and they've seen the last time they saw you was a week ago, so they think you must be better. And that side of it, I'd mm. say the mental, that, um, mental element is very, very tough, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, like I say, it's, but, like, I mean, I know you were humble about it, Nathan, but you did well to, to, to do it, do you know what I mean, after yeah. you're injured. Because you, you had months off at the time, like you say, yeah. in your prime, mm. City, just breaking through. So, um, like I said to you earlier, I thought you, I thought you were brilliant under Sven. Mm. I really did, and to, like that was towards the back end of the season as well, wasn't it? Mm. Around, mm. I'm sure it was around Christmas time the ball one goal. So mm. yeah, but I will. I'm I'm not from Manchester. I'm from Doncaster. And do you remember getting sent off against Doncaster Rovers? Yes, I do. Certain things I can't forget, my friend. Certain things I can't forget. Yeah. So do you want to tell the story? Do you want to do it? Well, I, I, I know it wasn't, it looked worse than it was, and it wasn't anything intentional. Yeah. I didn't mean to bring it up like that. Oh, no, uh, no, no but if you, <laughs> All I'm saying is, I got a lot of shit at school for the next two weeks after that game for us yeah. to go into that Doncaster Rovers side. Okay, let, so let me tell you about that then. So for people who don't know, there was a point where, for some reason, I was up front and someone played me a ball. And I took a touch that was too heavy because I was clean, I was clean through on goal. So I slid in to try and get the touch, but I tried to flick it over him and then I pulled my leg back. But to be completely honest, like there was still a collision with the goalkeeper, but I didn't like I didn't actually foul him. Mm. It's just two people like collided because as I say, I pulled my leg back. But the guy ended up yeah. breaking his leg. And the ref has come over and seen that he's in agony on the floor and, and thought that I must have done him. But I remember as soon as I missed yeah. the chance, I was so frustrated because I thought, oh, how have I missed that chance? Then the ref came over and threw a red card at me. And I was thinking, what, what's yeah. going on here? And people who were watching it on TV and people and like the referee afterwards said, well, we're going to rescind it. It's, very, it's an incorrect decision. And they did rescind it. But the downside of yeah. rescinding a card after a game is that it's already affected the game. So they're admitting the decision yeah. was wrong. But the decision was a huge factor in the game itself because at that point against them, they, Doncaster weren't flying or anything. Like we were comfortable in the match. Yeah. But then when they I, have I, a, I were there. One, yeah, exactly. But when they have like a more, when they have the man advantage and they're at home, they have the crowd, you know what I mean? Like it changes everything. Yeah. But like, as I say, like the, the goalkeeper himself, you know, I think I spoke to him after the game or what, whatnot. And he was, I think he was quite angry. But when he saw it back, you could see that there wasn't anything there. It was literally just a collision. Mm -hmm. But in real time, they thought it was like a horrible tackle. But throughout my entire career, I never gave any of those. So. Yeah, that was tough because that no. was the first red and it affected the game. And I, I felt so guilty. But ultimately, as I say, they rescinded it straight away. Well, I, I won't bring it up to give, give grief about it. I was just going to no, no, know no, that no. I got no. there, am I? <laughs> oh, mate, don't worry. So, so did I, but it's, this is fine, mate. I'm, I, looking back at my career, I've got closure on everything, so I've got nothing to worry about, Paul. So, as a City, I mean, as a City fan... People go on about like games have been to like the badge of honor games like York away and like that Doncaster Rovers game. Tell you another one. You actually, I actually checked because I thought you started the game, but I'm wrong. Do you remember playing EB Straymore? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I went to that one as well. Yeah. Uh, were you in the youth team with Shell and Logan? 
I was, yeah. He's um, he's a couple of years younger than me, but yeah, we were kind of coming up at similar sort of time. So he kicks on more. So when you were in that shirt, that was the Sven Goran Eriksson shirt, I think, not the Mark Hughes one. Yeah. And that's where that's when he kicked on, yeah. Yeah. Well, what it was, I I'd been to Malia and met him in this. He was in my hotel, and then we've gone to Oakwell and we sat next to each other in stands. Just a little bit of a story world. there for you. <laughs> tiny world, yeah. Tiny world. <laughs> so. Anyway, when I take you to Nadem, I talked about your Copenhagen goal. And yes. obviously, I listened to your podcast, and yes. I heard you bring this bad boy up. Okay. It's a goal, mate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, I remember, for those Euro, uh, UEFA Cup ties, that season under Mark Hughes, which I think was actually my best season, because I think I was up for player of the year that year for the club. But um, that season... In the Europe, in UEFA Cup, you travel to the game the day before and then you train in the stadium at like six, seven o'clock the night before. And then, you know, you go, and go to your rooms, all that stuff. And then the next day, you get ready for the game. And going to play Copenhagen, it was quite cold. We arrived at the stadium and it only had three stands that were done. And they were working on the fourth stand. And that stand had, um, had, pic- had pictures of fake fans, just a big wall. of Yeah, like, I remember. Fans. And I remember saying to myself, like, well, I said to Stephen Arne a couple of others, said, well, if I score, I'm going to celebrate there. But me, a defender, saying that, like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just a throwaway <laughs> comment. But then, lo and behold, the game was happening. And then somehow I'm clean through on goal. I'm looking to my right and I'm seeing, um, seeing Craig Bellamy asking for the ball to be squared. But I disregarded him. Tried to go for the Thierry on refinish in the far corner. Dragged the life out of it. And the, keep, the keeper's done so poorly with it. It's made it seem like I must have paid him off for that goal to go in. But it happened Jumped right it in, front, mate. Exactly. But it happened right in front of that stand where I said I was going to do it. So I'm a man of my word. So lo and behold, I went and celebrated in front of there. And looking back, it was, it was disrespectful to Copenhagen. But I never really thought about that at the time. And it felt like something fun to do. But yeah, yeah. I, uh, I remember that moment. I can't believe I called it. I did it. Like, there's no reason for me to be running through one on one in a UFC in a, in a, in a, in a time, but I did it. Yeah, well, because you're on left wing, one, not you? There's no reason for me to do that at all. <laughs> but, you know, that's where I find myself, huh? Yeah. So, um, an- another question I've been uh, asked to ask you before we get to the QPR game, which you've probably talked about 10 million times, is. Uh, Roberto Mancini. Mm-hmm. Uh, before you say anything, Chappie didn't have a nice word to say about him either, and I don't think he'll yeah. mind me telling that. But yeah, Chappie yeah. didn't have a nice word to say about him. Yeah. Um, um, so Chappie himself. Do you, do you want to ask me a specific question about him, or do you want to just talk? No, about I just want to know because, like, to to me, you was a Manchester City fan. A mm-hmm. good, a good, solid player. You'd have a, you had a, like you say, could have been player of the season under Mark Hughes. You had a good end of the season to Sven. So you sort of come back, start playing for Sven, played 31 games, I think, under Mark Hughes. Yeah. Then three under Mancini. Is it, is it yeah. three or te- it, ten possibly? It, well, it was, it's not a lot, but the, the irony behind the Mancini situation was. The day Mark Hughes got sacked, I played in the game and I got injured in that game. So it meant I was going to be out for three weeks. But I played well in that game and I was part of the starter for Mark Hughes. But Mancini came in like the next day. And then he was one of those people where very quickly, you know, you're trying to get a feel for someone, but you just couldn't get a feel for him because he was so, so different to what other people were like. Because I remember him getting really, like he'd say to me when I'm, I just started running. And they said with a calf injury, you can't come back quickly because if it goes again, you're going to be out for longer. Yeah. So they're always very, very cautious of that. And that's the injury that I had. And we yeah. were out like week two trying to jog. And he's looking at me saying, when are you back? When are you back? And I was, I was joking. So I think it's just another couple of weeks or whatever. This, that and the other. What I didn't realize was that his perception of injuries was whatever physio said it was. He's like, he would, he would diagnose it himself. If physio said six weeks, he'd be like, no, two weeks. And if you did for every day past that two weeks where you weren't back, he'd hold that against you. And I was all across the board for everybody. So I started off on the on the wrong foot. And then in that time, he was one of those where tactically, through those early years of my time at City, that was the best City were tactically because we literally had to do tactical training sessions every single day without fail for the duration of the time Mancini was there. And it was mm-hmm. to the point of obsession. Like it was 
you, you weren't really getting joy from going into training or anything like that because you had to do this, you had to do that. We were definitely going to do this, definitely going to do that. So as in terms of a coach, in terms of bringing him in, he, he, what he said he was going to bring, he brought because it, the team played exactly how we wanted. But in terms of personality and stuff like that, to be able to say link with people like Chappie, who's a significant part of the team, or to have relationships with players and so on and so forth, like he just wasn't there. And it wasn't there because he avoided people. It just wasn't there because of how he would speak to people and treat people. But that's mm. just who he was as a person. And I think in that 2012 season when they went on to win the league, that team was one of the most united teams that City had had for a very long time. And that's why they won it. It wasn't just because Mancini was in charge, because those mm. players came together. It was almost like there was a sense of unity, not fully against the manager, but they did it, I think, in spite of the manager. Because there nah. were times when the guys like saying to players, you know, they'd lose a game or whatever, and he gathers them all around and says, like, you guys are all no good without Yaya Toure. But you're saying that to, like, David Silvers and Tevez, mm. and, you know what I mean? Like, that stuff there is not... So in terms of his man management, it wasn't great, as, as Chappie would say, like, other bits weren't great. This is a guy as well, like, he kind of didn't see confrontation. Like, I spoke recently with one of the head physios at the time, and one year, when they were getting ready to travel to America for pre-season, all the staff were ready, geared up and all that stuff. And then they got in on the day to go and travel. And then the head physio, the head masseur, and I think someone else, the lead therapist, went on the list. And they weren't on the list because Mancini just didn't want them around. But you're going to be traveling to America without the key people within the system. But that's, that's like, those are the type of things he would do. And he would think it would just be normal for that to be the case. But it, it wasn't normal. So that's the general picture. And then for me personally, like, from the jump, as I say, it just wasn't just wasn't having me at all. There was nothing I could do, and that's what I found very difficult because I didn't know how I could try and win him over. I, mm. could walk, I couldn't talk him over. I couldn't play him over. Like he just wasn't interested at all in myself and a few others, and that was tough for me to take because up until that point, I played under every manager. The squad that we had was a squad who which I was playing with two months earlier, mm. but now I'm completely out of the picture. And then going into the next season, I was sent on loan. And then I came back after that low and after having a good season for, um, I got to Sunderland. I was in like, I think it was in like the Northwest, um, no, sorry, the Northeast, like team of the year, that type of stuff. I had a good season for them, came back motivated, ready to try and see if we can get back in the team. And then the preseason was supposed to start on the Monday. And on the Saturday, I got a text from Claire Marsden saying, I don't need to come in on the Monday, I got to come in on the following Saturday. So I was like, oh, we must have more time off. But no, it's because he wanted to bring in the first team to train Monday through Friday and then travel to America. And then myself, Craig Bellamy, I think Rocket Santa Cruz, Wayne Bridge, Adebayor, we were just going to train with the under-16s, essentially. And for as much as that was tough for them, that was one of the toughest times in my career because, like you said, I'm a Man City Academy graduate mm. who causes no fuss whatsoever, who's worked hard and has played with the team before. And now I'm being kept away from the team because they don't want me here and they think I might be destruct destructive either way. And that was tough, but then it got worse after they came back from pre-season because for all of us who were in that sort of Deadwood team, we weren't even allowed to train at the same time as the first team. He had us coming in at three o'clock in the afternoon because he knew the last player from the first team would have left by then and we had to come in and do that. And then to add another layer to this, there's myself and Wayne Bridge, like at some point after that first window closed, we were training with the first team finally and we, um, you know, we played a couple few cup games and so on. And it was an international break. And Mancini on the training pitch said, right, everybody, this international break, if you're not playing for your country, you'll be off from Saturday to Saturday. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Tried to book a trip away somewhere. Um, I booked it. It was going to be away for like four days somewhere. And then after the City game was finished, I got a text again. And it said, um, you're not off. You're going to be training this whole week. And it was me and Bridgie coming in to train by ourselves for the whole week. And it wasn't just a case of like training with the reserves. We trained the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe off Thursday, trained Friday, Saturday. In that time, the reserves weren't even in for all those days. Mm. We got to the point where on one Saturday, we were in doing gym work, just the two of us. And you think, well, what's you that see, about? And it, go on. With that, like, pe people get on on football as like, oh, you're getting paid a loads of money playing football. We, that's bullying. Yeah, it's I work for Johnny Council, right? Uh, and if somebody was treating me like that to that degree, ostracizing me, 
making yeah. me come in when nobody else is there. That's HR getting involved and they're getting in trouble but because it's football. It's fine, yeah. It's uh, it's, it's not fair. No, no. But then th- this is the thing, though, like, uh, even to this point now in the way that I describe it, I always start by telling you the plus points of him. Then I tell you my own personal experience mm. because as somebody who who ended up leaving under him, it's very easy to sound like you're a bitter ex-pro about something, but I'm not. I'm just telling you the reality of the situation. Mm. And in that time, I struggled the most because I never got closure. I never knew why that was happening, but it was always happening. And if you ever tried to address it, you'd shy away from it. And it left you in a place where, like, what, what are you supposed to do? And then ultimately, you know, I had to look. I mean, I've uh, read Craig Bellamy's book and Ian got a nice word to say about him. I mean, you'll probably know better than me, but Bellamy obviously struggled with injuries all his career as well. Mm. And was he on some sort of like light training regime and Mancini went, no, you're coming in every day. But he yeah. says, well, like, my knees, my knee physically can't do it. And he says, well, I don't care, you're coming in. Exactly, yeah. So that's, that, was, that's yeah. another player, Chappie. But then, like, I'm not... I'll just tell you, before I actually got doing this podcast, to me, I thought Mancini was sort of the odd manager we needed to sort of mm. to push us to that. Like, we had the good year under Sven. We did okay mm. under Hughes. And then the mm. Mancini were just like the, I don't like you, you don't like... like not not yeah. so much that. I thought he was like the bit of pushing. Yeah. Anyway, but obviously now, like what you're saying, it were more of, was against him, but um, he raised the expectation but, level because he was somebody whereby, like, if you didn't win, he, like he expected to win every game. If you made it to a cup final under Mancini, he, he's not happy to be there. He expects to win, and that was based on the career that he had as a player with yeah. exceptional Italian talent. And in some ways, you know, that did help. But like I say, if he had a bit more empathy, I think he would have stayed for longer. And it got to a see, point where I think some of the biggest stars were going to leave if he didn't leave. And that says a lot, considering they were title winners at that point. Well, true. Um, and it's, it sort of explains that Wigan Cup final, but I'm not going into that. But, <laughs> uh, like, I remember him bringing sort of Patrick V, when he brought, well, I'll, I'll get onto Vieira in a minute, but like, he brought, do you remember Garrido? Yeah, I remember having yeah, yeah. Garrido won't get a kick at ball, and he brought him in, and then I think he scored a, a brilliant free kick against Wolves or somebody like that. And I wouldn't have thought... And then, like, dealing with Mario. I love Mario, but obviously he's a bit of a loose cannon, isn't he? Dealing with somebody mm. like him. And mm. then a player, like you said, like I said, a text chappy. That is no lie. That's gospel. And he texts me that back. Why, why, why would he deal with somebody like Mario, who's a pain in the arse, even though I loved him, and mm. then not deal with somebody who's a professional like you? But... So, sort of like Patrick Vieira, why why would a player like Patrick Vieira deal with him? So, with Patrick, Patrick had played in Italy twice before. And the Italian culture, in terms of how they play football, is something which he'd experienced before. So, him coming back to England, he wasn't coming back to England to play like an English style and understand English day-to-day stuff, because he'd done that already. He was coming back to play, essentially, under an Italian-style manager who trusted him, because I think he might have played for him before. So, with that mm. being the case, like, it was easy for Patrick, but then let's be clear as well. Patrick, for as good as he is and good as he was, that wasn't Patrick Vieira at his peak of his powers anyway. So he was in a no. different spot. But his leadership and stuff like that off the field helped a lot because in some ways he was more of a goal between. So he, because yeah. he knew the Italian culture and stuff like that, he knew sometimes Mancini would be trying to say something, but he's not saying it the right way. So Patrick would be telling certain players, this is what he's actually trying to say because he understood it more so than say... Uh, other players in the, in the team who hadn't experienced that Italian manager in England before. See, I thought Vieira a bit of an underrated player in that FA Cup win. Um, mm. Not not so much the final, but the lead up to it, I felt like he was a senior head to chuck on when it was getting a bit tight. Like if we were 1-0, chuck him on, he sort of like slow play down. I'm, I'm guessing that's listen, how you felt about him. Listen, well. listen, Patrick, Patrick Vieira, like after... From being the guy who was watching him when he was playing at like main road, flicking over people's heads and stuff like that, putting on a masterclass, to then be sitting across from him or walking out to the training pitch next to him, even if he's not his absolute best, he's still at a different level to where I was at my peak. So it was almost like it was an honour to see him then. You can see the characteristics that he had in terms of being one of the most iconic players in Premier League history. And he handled every situation fine, even though physically he might have been where he was when he was younger. 
tactically and all that stuff mentally different different gear mate people who've won world cups and all that a different gear i promise you yeah well that, that's what you want in the dressing room isn't it so yeah. so the the loan spell to sunderland uh how did you feel about that coming about were you thinking well this is this is just me going to get some games under my belt and come back stronger or are you thinking this is me trying to get eggs to out no, I, uh, I'll i be honest with you. Like, when I first found out that I was going to be leaving, I, I was like, I brought down in tears because there I was a Manchester boy. And you forget that, like, the dream of playing for the club that you support in your hometown is actually, like, it doesn't happen for 99% of people, but I was doing it. And all of a sudden, I realised I was doing it the moment I got told to leave. And don't get me wrong, like, yeah. the time at Sunderland was incredible. Like, I made some great friends there. I played some great football, played in some big occasions, played in a great stadium, all that stuff. Like, finished top 10. So it was really good. But that whole feeling of leaving and entering somewhere new is something which I never experienced. And throughout my time, when I was regular for City, I never thought about leaving one time. Didn't matter if someone was coming in. It was like, well, it didn't matter. Like, I know I'm not going anywhere. I'm obviously going to stay at City. I'm obviously going to stay at City. So then to all of a sudden have to deal with those emotions and try and figure out how to leave a club, especially when it's your yeah. club in your city. Like, I'm not just leaving, yeah. say, the team. I'm leaving the city that... I'm from and I live in and my friends and all that stuff. So it was, yeah. weird. It was, very, it was very weird. And again, look at the Mancini time because there was no closure associated with it whatsoever. Like you just don't, you just don't know what was to come next because some of those loans, you can see it in two ways. You can see a loan whereby say you go out this year and then you leave, which ended up being what I did the next year. Or you look at say, for example, that this year specifically, you see Jesse Lingard doing well at West Ham and there's a good chance next year he'll come back to United and he'll be mm. part of the team, you know, but, you don't know what it is when you go, but then I know that when I went, that's when City won the FA Cup. So that puts me on the back foot even more because now they're winning yeah. things while I'm not there. And it's almost like vindication for them. But I remember my agent spoke to me and he said, do you want to stay at Sunderland or do you want to go back to City? And for as much as I enjoyed my time at Sunderland, I thought going back to City, maybe playing 20 games in a season, but the 20 games are part of like a Champions League run, a flipping Premier League run, a Cup run. I'd rather do that than be at Sunderland and just solely try and finish top 10. And I think that was probably one of the biggest mistakes I made because I came back, spoke to the manager, he said he'll get back to me. And then it's been a couple of weeks later, he's calling me saying, yeah, he's gone find somewhere else to play. And I'm like, right, okay, that's where we're at then. That is it. Uh, and then obviously, so then you left. Mm. I mean, you must, I mean, obviously the QPR, you did get relegated. We yeah. played some good football under him and it must be your second team. No, now. listen, listen, listen. I've played more games for QPR than did for Man City. But the thing with QPR is it was in London and that's not my home. But my legacy there is one, as I say, like I played, I played all near 220 games for that team across the two divisions, sometimes in the Premier League, sometimes in the Championship. Got promoted with them, got relegated with them twice. Like I was a part of a very significant section of the club's history. And I yeah. did overall enjoy my time there, even though we had lots of lows and things like that. The highs were special. But, like, it, it wasn't something I wanted to do at the start. I had no desire. As a northerner, I've got, I had no desire to move to London, like none whatsoever. But I got told that this is what I have to do. Because, again, yeah. I've never been... Well, from the year before, I'd never been on loan. All of a sudden, I'd never been sold. And someone said, oh, QPR put a bid in for you. I was like, so what? So then they say, well, <laughs> that, means you've got to go, that means you've got to go down and speak to them. I was like, oh... Oh, right. Okay. So you go down and speak to them, and they're saying, Well, this is what's going to happen. And then City's saying, Well, you have to go if you want to play. And yeah. then you're left with a thing because I, I left in January, and they said basically people made a valid point that, Well, if you, if you, you've not played this first half of the season really in the league. So if you choose to stay, you're probably not going to play in the second half. And as a player, when you've got limited seasons ahead of you, can you afford to spend a whole year not playing? And there were just so many weird mm. things that year. So before I left, um, so I was training with the 16s. And then I didn't leave the first transfer window. This is the 2011-12 season. But then on the very 1st of September, I think was, or maybe the second was when City played their first Champions League game against Napoli. So I've been in the wilderness. I was playing like Staley Bridge Celtic and all sorts of like conference teams yeah. in pre-season. But then that day, I look at the squad goes up and I'm, in, I'm, the, ni I'm the 19th man in the squad. And I'm like, okay. That's weird. But I think that was to do with like, um, you know, like a thing of homegrown. Like homegrown. So yeah, exactly. So that I'm thinking, okay, so this is my role at the club now. I'm homegrown. 
So did I play, I played, oh, it essentially was. So I played in a couple of Carling Cup games and so on. And again, it was nowhere near like an actual league game. And then the weirdest thing was I played I played one game that season in the league and it was the last, it was the one the day before I went to QPR and I came on, we were like 2-1 up against Wigan and Mancini loved to throw in an extra centre-back to go three at the back and I played the last 10 minutes of that and it was an important win or whatever because, you know, it helped like finish off the season and that. And I remember thinking to myself, like, why does he trust me to come on to seal a game that's been a tough game at this exact moment but for the rest of the season, he's not even thought of me one time. And now that I'm leaving, he says he wants me to play. It was bizarre, mate. It was, like, you talk about mind-bending. Like, I had no idea what day of the week it was in Drew. And that's one of the toughest things I've ever had to deal with. But I left The thing is, right, if he'd have come to you after the game and said, look, Nadim, I chucked you on. Uh, I thought you'd get a farewell to the fans and get... No, but if he'd have said that to yeah, you, you'd have thought... Like, well, obviously... Yeah, fair enough. I'm not saying he did it for that, but... No, I definitely wouldn't. No, listen, he doesn't have sentiment, doesn't have a single sentimental bone in his body, mate. And he didn't Mm. care about me. So all of a sudden, why would he do that? It was bizarre, mate. I was stunned. When I was on his squad, I was stunned. Then when he called me to say, come, you come in, I was like, huh? Like, what is this? (laughs) That came on. And that, unfortunately, as as mad as it is, like, I played a lot of games for City, but that game meant a lot to me to be able to go out there, you know, just one last time. And, yeah. you know, to, to be a win. And thankfully, you know, it ended up being something which helped in the run to win the league. Because if you don't, say, if you, for example, if you were messed up or whatever, then who knows how the, league, the season would have gone after that. Yeah. So, the I, I actually feel bad asking you about this QPR game because, honestly, I bet you're sick of it. But we need, we need to hear it. Uh, right. The emotions, the ex-City boys on the QPR team, like... I'm not going to ask you no questions about it. You just give me your your run through of your feelings okay. and everything. Listen, so I've spoken about it a lot, but next year is the 10 year anniversary, so I dread to think how many more times I'll talk about it next year. But they're putting it into respect. shirt, aren't they? Have you seen the new oh, city right. shirt? No, I've not. No, is that what they're doing? The, the new city shirt, it's 93 20 is like all, all over uh, it. it, just does 93 20 all over it. So, okay. So for me, as I said, I've described that last six. That first six months of the season under Mancini, and it was, it was horrendous, basically. And lest we forget as well, Mancini came in to replace Mark Hughes. So now Mark Hughes is QPR, and he was a big reason why I went to QPR, because I trusted him as a manager, and I thought he got the, got the best out of me. But QPR were like fourth bottom at the time, maybe fifth bottom when I went over there. And this is me finally leaving the club and not having the fallback of knowing I'm a City player, because going on loan, like, when things are going terribly like you always know that you're not really a part of it overall. Yeah. So you yeah. don't necessarily feel the same emotions as somebody who has the consequence of dealing with whatever goes wrong the next season. But thankfully, you know, we didn't have any of those moments at Sunderland. So yeah, I'm going over and, you know, I signed for the club and went, okay, I'm living in London now. This is it. There's no fallback. There's no I'm Man City anything. Like I'm a QPR guy. And I'm starting to get to know the players get to know the city, the stadium, the training ground, and everything's different. For as much as it wasn't primetime Carrington or primetime current training ground like City have now, it was still a very good training ground. But the QPR ones, Porter Cabins, just by the M25, basically. So yeah. it's, a different, it's a different world, different world straight off the bat, different style of football, different expectation level. And like, I'm thinking, okay, right then, this is it. Dig in. We need to try and stay up. So you're trying to learn about people and learn your role within a team but in a team that's losing most weeks that's one of the toughest things to do but we managed to get to a point where going into that City game we were outside of the bottom three courtesy of a last minute goal the week before against Stoke and it was kind of in our hands but looking back it sounds nuts to say it was in our hands because we're going away to Man City the team who might have dropped two points at home all season so yeah. you can talk about underdogs and then you can talk about QPR away at Man City. Yeah. Um, so in the week, after we beat Stoke the week before, I then all eyes are now on that Man City game ahead. I'm first thinking I need to make sure I'm fit for this game. I'm then thinking like all the different scenarios of how the game could go and what it could mean, right? So if QPR win, City lose the title, City win. Like we might, <laughs> if City win and Bolton win, we might get relegated. And I'm thinking the thing I don't want more than anything 
is for City to win and me be relegated at the hands of the manager who let me go in front of the fans who used to support me in my own city. Yeah. You know, like, that was still home for me. And I think that was summed up when we arrived. Like, we got the train up from London. And me getting the train from London to Manchester isn't me travelling for an away game. That's me going home. We got from the train to the hotel. Again, that's me going home. We're walking around the ho- walking around the hotel. Like I- I'm telling people, yeah, this is Dean's Gate. You know, this is this street. This is that place. That's me yeah. at home. But like, I'm not there with City anymore. And then on the game day, I I said hello to every single person from the moment you get off the bus at the stadium because I knew them for all the years that I've been yeah. in City. But I'm now surrounded by people who have known two, three months. Some people I don't know very well at all, but the task at hand is to do whatever. But like I say, I know this person, no security, yeah. you know the person with the cars, the chefs, the whatever. Like, oh, hey. And then even all the players in the City team, well, some of the players in the City team, these were some of my closest friends at the time. You know, so this was now surreal yeah. because the first time I'm playing against City after leaving is the most important game of my career to date. And I go down the stairs, I turn right instead of turning left which was weird. I'd never even seen the away dressing room. And now I'm in it with my gear there. <laughs> now I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in a tunnel getting ready to go out for the warm-up. And it's a serious game, so you don't want to be like, oh, blah, 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 whatever, chilling out of everyone. But I'm standing across from people who are like some of my best friends in football. But I can't be, but I've got to be mm-hmm. like, put this game face on because the people around me for QPR, they don't know them. So their minds are like, bang, yeah. we have to do something. So I'm caught in this weird spot, which I never thought I'd be in. Go out anyway, do the warm-up, business time, game started. And then that was the weirdest thing. All the emotions, stuff I was feeling in the build, as soon as the game started, it was just a normal game of football. And everything was going fine for us. Yeah. We weren't attacking much or anything until Zaba scored. And then when Zaba scored, that's when City were going to be winning the league. And that's the exact point where I think uh, Bolton had scored, who was the important game on our side as well. And we were getting yeah. relegated out. We were getting relegated at half time. And to make it worse, for me personally, I remember the some of the city fans on the side opposite of Colin Bell stand, I forget which one is, whether it's east or west, they were singing for Martin Petrov at Bolton. So I was there <sighs> on the field. Like they don't obviously you know it's just a bit of humor or whatever. But to see those fans in yeah, no, singing for my team, I don't you know what I mean? It's just humor, but like that was to me. Yeah, but that was cutting me because they didn't yeah. realise that, like, for me, that was everything. So we're going at half time. Yeah. We're having a team talk saying, right, come on, we need to get a result. We need to get a goal or whatever. And again, it's that moment of, you know, you can talk about underdogs and you can talk about City being 1 0 up against QPR with QPR needing to win at the Etihad. Again, it's a diff- whole different thing. So we said we were going to do this. We were going to, we were motivated. We're going to do whatever. But the reality of the situation is nobody would have put money on QPR to come back at that point. But we went out. Next thing we score, next thing we're, we're winning, we're down to 10 men. And I'll be honest, so obviously I didn't score in the 93rd minute or whatever it was. But the 15 minutes prior to that were probably the worst football that City had played throughout that whole season. And as an old style exactly. City fan, yeah, because they weren't, they didn't, we were going nowhere. So we were lower than a low block. We were basically just a wall in front of the goal. It's like we had no yeah. desire to go anywhere. The first because we were down yeah. to 10 men and second because we were winning. So the ways in which they would probably previously draw teams out and so on and so forth, it wasn't there. I think Vincent and Jolien were taking turns, taking shots and stuff like this going forward. Yeah. Like It wasn't a normal performance because it wasn't a normal game. Like Mancini was losing his nut on the sideline. It was. He'd, he'd gone berserk. And Let me just interrupt you quick, Nader. Mark Bircham, he were uh, coaching for QPR at the time, wasn't he? And he said... Yeah, he was, yeah. What people don't... I mean, I was in the crowd and I was probably one of these guys the crowd had turned nasty, yes, and it yes. people yes. people don't realise that when you watch it, Sky Sports and the scoring, it got yeah. nasty, and it yeah. But that's because of that old school sort of like if you're an old style City fan, you almost expect disappointment. And here was disappointment yeah. being delivered in the last game, in the last minutes of, of the season. You know what I mean? Mm. Like that, it's almost like you expected it to happen, and it wasn't. It wasn't good. But then the Edin scores his goal, and then. You know, they obviously the, the goal, the next goal goes in to make it 3 2. But for me, I didn't know that we were safe until after the goal had gone in. So I thought yeah. initially we were down and I was panicking. I thought, this is a mess. This is the lowest of the lows. But when we then found out that, you know, we were safe, all of a sudden I look around and our fans, the QPR fans on the far side by the thousands, were all celebrating. 
Mark Hughes is yeah. celebrating next to Roberto Mancini. And even though yeah. you know, we didn't win a league, we achieved our own goals. And one of my... Um, so one of my old teammates in Joey Barton or whatever, he was different to myself and Tron Wright Phillips, who still had a feeling of sentiment towards City. Joey didn't yeah. or whatever. Like, he's... He's always been motivated by different things. And Scouser so anyway, isn't he? But yeah, <laughs> but it was something. But it was something which he said, which disappointed me because after he got sent off, I, I remember not seeing him after the game. Like some of it was to do because I, I stayed in Manchester or whatever. But he didn't apologise or anything like that, from how I remember it. And the reason he said he didn't is because he was upset that people were celebrating after staying up on the last day. And the thing that I think sums it all up was say, so we had beers in our dressing room and City had champagne in theirs because I remember being in both, but. What he forgets is for what QPR was as a team, as a club, and in terms of the players that were there, some of those players, 17th in the Premier League was the highest they ever finished in their careers. So he wants to downplay and yeah. say you want to be achieving something. But there were lots of people, as I say, who never matched that high. have never even gotten the opportunity mm. again to play in the Premier League. So let's be very, very yeah. clear about it. You know, he might have that belief about himself, but read the room and understand where you're at because you're not a place who's trying to go for the top four. And that achievement itself, like try and tell the people who finish behind you in 18th, 19th, 20th, the 17th doesn't matter. Mm. And I bet they give absolutely anything to get that feeling. Mm. But it was a nuts day and it ended up being one of the nicest feelings of my life. But it was very stressful for a week, to say the very least. See, uh, that that QPR team, team, like you said, I'm surprised. I mean, I've heard mixed things about Joe Barton. And like I say, I've never met him or anything, so I'm not going to make any points of him. But that QPR team it sort of got like some big names in and then it was like a bit mm. of a mish, mish, mish smash, wasn't it? Yeah. It, uh, it, was, yeah. But... It, was, um, it was one of those where like the identity of the club had changed once they came to the Premier League because it was a significant investment which was put in. But one thing about investment, as I saw with City to a certain extent, extent like if you just invest and the club and the players and the stuff don't have a true identity, then the the sort of player turnover becomes quite great because you're always buying new players when there's not sort yeah. of like stability with management and stuff like that. So they invested to try and keep up. But then, like, as I say, Clint Hill ended up doing very well for the club at the Premier League level. But that was his first time playing in the Premier League. And now you're putting him next to somebody who's yeah. playing in the Premier League for, say, four or 500 games. So with that, you've got understanding where things are going well. It's great. But in terms of identity when things aren't going well, some people are coming from leagues where, where things aren't going well, you just bed in and just tough it out. But now you're yeah. playing next to somebody where when things aren't going well, they say, well, let's show some personality, let's get the ball down, let's move the ball and this, that and the other. And yeah. the two things can't be in the same team at the same time because you end up with failure, no. which is what we ended up with. Yeah, it was sort of like, uh, like you say, I mean, this is nothing against any foreign players, but and I don't mean it like this, but Sort of when you're in the dogfight, you need a gritty, like, no, nothing's get like, like, I mate, mean, we, we're City fans, we know what it's like, like the Sylvan Distan, Richard Dunn sort of mentality. Yeah. They're, they're not yeah. fly, they're not going to fly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's sort of what you need to stay up. But um, yeah. anyway, back to the game, Nadum. A lot of people said, would you have took Sergio Aguero down if you tried to? Take another torch and give a penalty away. <laughs> um, I know you wouldn't, so have, but that's it's, it's interesting. It's interesting you say that. It's interesting you say that because one thing about say playing against City, the thing that which I had over other people was that the fact that I've just spent the last six months playing with them. So certain things that they were doing, mm. I'd seen them practice it in training and all that stuff. So with Sergio, like Sergio is yeah. one of the best of the best, but the way that I would approach him would be different to somebody else who never play, who never would play against him ever on a day to day basis. So I think if yeah. if I would have been in the matchup, I might have done a bit better. Sergio probably still would have scored, but it would have been a different type of thing because of the way that he sort of like yeah. nicks this and nicks that. Like I'd seen that before, so it wasn't necessarily a shock to yeah. me. But yeah. In some ways, you know, I'm just, it didn't matter in the end. But what a weird feeling that would have been if, say, like Sergio takes a shot at the <laughs> and then City don't win the league. Talk about not being welcome back home. Yeah. Oh, I'm about to say you won't be going to that. Uh, win. Not really here at half time, would you? Oh, that is a fact, <laughs> mate. That is a fact, yeah. So I've kept you for long enough, Nadam. So I'll just go through a few few little tidbits. So the best city manager you played under, and he, he doesn't meet or trained under, he doesn't need to be like you don't necessarily need to say use because he 
played you more. It's just more what you like, the training, the personality, the uh, man management. It, I'm guessing uh, Mancini's up there. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you would have said the most, the best coach in terms of getting a team to play, then I'd say Mancini. But for me, I'll say Kevin Keegan. Oh, I'm only joking. <laughs> no, no, he's not going to be the same. But I'll say Kevin, Kevin Keegan, because like, as I say, when I came in, it's crazy because the club was still looking to try and play nice football. And then, you know, we had we had Stuart Pierce next where the emphasis wasn't on nice football. So to have had that concept of nice football at that start point of my career, you know, it went, it went a long way. And he gave my debut and said, all right, I want you to play right back so you can get better at the ball, on the ball. And there were some really good players in that team. When I was, Even when I first started training with the first team, because you had like Bernabias and Berkovic's and Elkers and stuff. Yeah. So the club at that good point, players. like it was, yeah, they were, these were very good players. So I'm going to say Kevin Keegan. Right, my next one. You're going on a night. I don't know if you drink, Nadem. Looking at you, I don't think you do. But <laughs> <laughs> if you're going on a if you're going on a night out, and I don't mean like just going for a meal, we're going for a big beer session. Five city yeah. players you played with, who are you taking with you? Um, uh, I'll say. Are you talking about for like a really reckless one, like exceptionally reckless? Yeah, we're not uh, we're not play we're not playing ground. It's twelve till one minimum. Twelve twelve okay. in the morning till one in the morning. <laughs> so I'd say I'd have to say Richard Don, Nicky Weaver, Michael Richards, um who else would be absolutely all over it. Um I'll throw in just oh, for God. the one year they was there, I'll say like Paul Bosfeld, because he was good, he was he was good for a drink. And yeah. I'd say for hijinks, I'd say I'd say no, I'd say Joe Hart as well. He loves it. So he'd be he'd be well up yeah. for it as well. Yeah. Do, do you know what? I could have guessed them. I mean, uh, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but I think it was Jim Jim Whitley who told us that Richard Dunn once left his car in pub for so long that a tree grew through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's uh, Dunny, listen, Dunny for as good as he was and as much of a pro as he was later on. Like, you know, we all remember him having a few incidents when he was younger. But what a good guy though, man. I'd, I'd love to share yeah. a drink with him at some point, yeah. Yeah, I felt he, he was one of them that he should have probably had another season with City, but he went to Villa and he had a good year, a couple of years at Villa, didn't he? So, exactly, right. yeah. The most under, underrated player you played with um, and uh, I, at City, but maybe there's two parts of this. Maybe like amazing in training, but it never transitioned to the pitch or just sort of like went under the radar, whichever way you want to go with it. Mm, that's a good question. Um... <laughs> Uh, well, it's a tough one. Like, say, ask you the question: How do you remember Carlos Tevez? Do you remember him in a way which was great before Sergio came in, or what? Because for me, no, uh, he was like, great. He, okay, because as far as for to me, me, when he was great, when Sergio first came in and he was doing well for that first year, I still preferred Carlos Tevez. Now it seems like a wild mm. take to say Tevez over Guerrero, but Carlos was like. He was like, how's Carlos Tevez come from Man United to come to Man City? This Argentine yeah. number nine or whatever, with this work ethic and all this stuff. Um, but if he's obviously like, you know, that underrated thing, I think it's a bit of a reach. But uh, I would say someone who I would have liked to have seen stay longer at City, I would say uh, Stephen Ireland. Because in training, he was one of those players where in five-a-sides and stuff, there were certain players who you needed to have in your team if you knew you wanted to win. And he was, without question, one of those in that era. And I think he... I'm not sure if he was there when Mancini was there and so on, but he ended up going. And when I think he could have suited that style of play a lot more than the styles which came before. And, you know, there was talk that... He knew... Like, I was... Go on. I was... Say- he went, Mark Hughes stopped his transfer, I believe. Yeah. When Mark Hughes came in, he was uh, Stephen Allen was going and Mark Hughes stopped it. And then he became then he became player of the season. Phenomenal. season. Yeah. Like with Stevie, the, the yeah. debate I used to have it with Michael, it was like you'd say, oh, who's better, Michael Johnson or Stephen Ireland? And I always say Stephen Ireland, but I was biased because Steve was in my youth team. But then as time passed, like Stevie, I don't think he's yeah. fulfilled all his true potential. But there were times when I'd see him in training and stuff like that. And as I say, he's, he was incredible, to say the very least. And that was alongside Robinho's and Alano's and all that stuff. Yeah, he suited 
with that team though, didn't it? And Sturridge. I mean, I'm surprised yeah. Sturridge didn't get as many games under my yeah. as, as he probably should have. Yeah, yeah but I it's thought just, they it's... they gelled well. Mm, they did. They did. I'm I'll there. Be, I'll be honest at least, with you. at least. Sorry, go on. Oh, good. well, I'm going to say, like, I listened to your Daniel Sturridge uh, podcast and I'm surprised he didn't say more about Rubinho because I thought them two just had, like, an unspoken bond. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember, right. I don't know if you remember when Rubinho whipped that ball in at Blackburn away, mm. last minute, mm. Daniel Sturridge scored. It was, like, last minute goal. Mate. Daniel, let me be clear, yeah. So, at that time, with City, when Alino, Alano and Rubinho were in the same team, if they were in a five side, it's game over. But the next in line at that time, in my opinion, were Daniel Sturridge and then Stephen Island. So any combination of those four, and it was a tough day for whoever. And looking back, Daniel Sturridge was like 19 at the time. <laughs> but we're looking at Robinho, who's essentially a Galactico the year before. But you put him with Daniel Sturridge in training, and they're incredible. And I think that said a lot about Daniel's potential at that time, because he was special. And he's someone, unfortunately, like timing-wise for City. He probably would have been greater in later generations. But still, you know, he's had a very yeah. good career and he's still got more to come as well, I think. See, he sort of left... I mean, I don't I don't buy into all press shit, if I'm honest with you. But he sort of got painted in a bit of a bad light while he left. To, to be a City fan, it was all about money and that. But to be fair, I don't think it was all about money, but he wasn't playing as much as I thought he should. Do you get what I mean? Mm. I were at the Sheffield United game when he scored his first goal, and I was mm. like, other than his bad dancing ability, he, mate, he, he were a player. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. But, no, he, he, it's, so, so it's easy, as a, when you talk about players, it's easy to just relate it to money. It's always easy to do so. And like money is always a factor in every yeah. decision that we make, but that's just, that's just the world itself. Because you're seeing people who go from job to job and yeah. they're not doing it so they can get paid less money. The plan is, is to try and make more, but it's, part, it's all part of the consideration, not just the only thing. Yeah, and people don't realise how much clubs in PR in their favour with players leaving, yes. and whatever, do they? Like, I, I, I'm pretty open-minded to it now. Like, And I know a Pep is bang, he's good with the media. He just tells them what they want to hear and he just shrugs his shoulders. He's not bothered. And and that's what I've learned it from. But Nadam, I feel like I've kept you enough now and it's been brilliant. And uh, if we win the Champions League, are you going to come on for an end of season chat? Chappie's already Listen, signed mate. up to it. Uh, Listen, mate. Campbell if we... him, so we'll have a bit yes, of a... If we win the Champions League, you'll see me everywhere, mate. Just think of Nader Manuha available <laughs> everywhere. I'll be on every podcast, every TV show, every, everything, mate. Don't you worry about that. Expect me on, mate. See, I, I like doing it on air. Uh, I had Campbell Atten on, Ricky Atten's son, and I said to him, if you win a world title, Campbell, can I carry your belt in? Because you were on air, he was like, yeah, 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 Cam. No, listen, so, you'll, fi you'll right, find man. me. you'll find me everywhere, mate. If it happens, I guarantee I'll be celebrating everywhere. Don't worry about that. Sound, mate. Well, Nadam, it's been fantastic. I don't know if we talked about your career enough, but we talked about a bit of everything. I enjoyed it. I hope everybody else does there. So, like I say, I'll uh, give you a text after Nadam thanking you again anyway. But thanks again, pal. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, oh, pleasure's on my mind. And mate. anybody out there, anybody out there, if you haven't what, listened to Nadam and Noah, keep Kick it, is it kicking it back with Nadam? It's no, it's kick it's kick back with Nadam and it's available everywhere. Give it a listen. There's probably someone there who you it's might want to have a listen to. Decent, decent. I was listening to the Mark Hughes one before I come in, come to talk to Nadam, but I was a under nine girls football training after going gold, so I had to stop listening to it. <laughs> okay, no worries. No worries. <laughs> so thanks a lot then, mate, and I'll uh, no catch you later. Okay. No worries, mate. Take it easy. Thanks, thanks for the chat. Bye.